Hey, everybody. Welcome back to the Sharp Sense Podcast. This is your host, Jonah Lupton, and we're bringing another great episode today. So on the phone, I have Bobby Johnson. He is the co-founder of a company called Interana. The website is interana.com, I-N-T-E-R-A-N-A.com. And essentially what they do is they help companies analyze their data. And obviously, we'll talk more about that in a few minutes because that's a very vague description, but I think Bobby will do a better job. Company is based in Redwood City, which is in the Bay Area. Uh, they've raised approximately forty-six million dollars over a few rounds. The company was founded back in two thousand thirteen. Uh, Bobby actually spent six years at Facebook from two thousand six to two thousand twelve, uh, prior to starting this company, and then he went through Y Combinator early on as well. Uh, his wife is actually one of his co-founders, so we'll talk about that also. And I think that's pretty much it for the intro. So let's welcome Bobby. Bobby, how are you, man? Hey, doing great. I'm excited to be here. Absolutely, man. I think I uh, appreciate you taking the time. So talk to us about your company. What exactly do you guys do? So what we do is we make it really easy for people to look at the data that their company collects. And so, uh, you know, and depending on what kind of company it is, it's all kinds of different things. Uh, for a web or mobile app, it's clicks on their application. Um, we work with Comcast and they collect uh, information about truck rolls and uh, call center calls. So we take whatever is kind of the data that makes uh, that makes your business your business, and we make it really easy for everybody to look at it. Um, so we have a uh, we have both the back end, but then also a visual interactive tool that makes it uh, really easy for everybody to to dig in and learn about what's happening with their customers, with their users, or devices, whatever is uh, makes their business. Um, cool. And so. Uh, yeah, so for um, some of our customers, we have uh, uh, every swipe on Tinder, every search on Bing, um, every song play on a Sonos box ends up getting looked at in our in our software to help the, the people who work at those companies understand how to make their products better, how to make their customers more successful. So, I mean, I'm looking at your your customer list, and I'm sure this is just a small sample size, but you know, companies like SurveyMonkey and Tinder and Microsoft and uh, what else? Yesware uh, and Sauna. Next door, I mean, some very well-known uh, Fortune 500 tech companies, as well as some very large, you know, VC-backed tech companies as well. Um, I mean, do you guys have to customize what you're doing, your product or your service or your software for each company individually? Uh, no, we don't customize the software at all. It's uh, it's a pretty general purpose tool for looking at stuff. Uh, the data, obviously, is very different for each of them. So, okay. um, you know, so, so the... So the things that each company cares about is, uh, is sort of surprisingly different across companies. What would be like an example of Tinder? Because most of us are familiar with that, the dating app, you know, where people are swiping left or right. What, what, what kind of data could Tinder get from, you know, with your service that would help them make the product better? So they care about things, for instance, uh, they care about if they're looking at match quality. One of the things they can know is okay. they can look at uh, chat sessions and if they're long or short, uh, they can look at things like what are behaviors on right and left swiping in terms of, you know, where should they put a paywall to be kind of most effective? Um, what kinds of interactions lead to people leaving the site uh, or leaving the service? Um, so a lot of questions about retention and also about uh, sort of details of product usage to, uh, to really understand what, uh, what makes somebody have a good experience in a session versus a bad experience. Now, this is such a, a you know, diverse group of companies um, how do you price your product for each company? Uh, we do it by the amount of data. Okay. So by the amount of like gigabytes of data? So it's actually by the number of events stored. So one okay. of the things we think is important is that most important business questions really have to do with time. And so the data that we work with is uh, what we call event data, which is basically this thing happened at this time. Uh, and you know, there's sequences of these things. And so we, we just charge people by the number of events that they load in, um, which is pretty straightforward and everybody seems to understand it. Now, when you were on the way out of Facebook, so you spent six years there, certainly in six of their fastest growing years, um, why did you decide to leave Facebook? Was it just because you saw this as a, a huge opportunity for the future? Um, no, I think it was, uh, I mean, six years, is a, that was a very intense six years. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I was... I, uh, honestly, I need a little bit of a rest. <laughs> and, uh, when was the IPO? I guess you left right before the IPO. Yeah, I left right before the IPO. Okay. Um, uh, and so actually I just took some time off and didn't really do anything. Just tried to, just tried to relax. And, uh, but then, uh, you know, I, I kind of knew that I was going to do something in the data space, but then I basically spent a whole summer, um, 
just talking to lots and lots of people about what they needed and what they what they ha what they were happy with and what they were unhappy with. And you know, what was, to... and then you guys went through Y Combinator. So had you raised any capital before Y Combinator? No, we basically we incorporated the day like of you know at the the first week of Y Combinator. So that was uh, yeah. As we formed the company, we kind of decided we wanted to do that, uh, and. Uh, so that was our, uh, you know, we started the company, started writing code, like while we were in Y Combinator for that, for that three months. Okay. So you guys really didn't have a product going into it then? No, not at all. And it was, uh, yeah, Y Combinator was really interesting because it was a very good, uh, you know, it, it pushed very hard to get early product done. And with like kind of a big enterprise product, there's a lot of, uh, you know, a lot of, most people go about it spending a very long time like building the thing and it was good to have that that push to just get something to get people start right right start no, using certainly, it immediately out the door yeah. why coming or definitely wants you to focus you know focus and build fast and go talk to your customers and see what they want it sounds like you guys did a lot of that early on too yeah we did a lot of yeah i mean what they would always say is there's only two things you should do talk to your customers and build your products and that's the still the best advice we got <laughs> the whole time in this company so coming out of Y Combinator, were you still just a team of three? Uh, yeah, so we're a team of three coming out of Y Combinator. And then and Y Combinator does really kind of set you up to go into the uh, sort of the traditional VC fundraising. And so coming out of Y Combinator, we, we, we raised money and then started hiring people off that. Was that the $8.2 million round in October 2014? Yeah, so that was the, uh, yeah, we had done Winter 13 YC and then the round ended up closing okay. by October. And so, yeah, kind of that summer we started bringing people on um, and we'd, we'd raised a little bit of seed money along the way there, but uh, you know, it was all kind of the, the coming out of Y Combinator. What did, what did you like it, uh, with those, uh, the investors at least that are showing up on Crunchbase for that first round or Battery, which I'm familiar with, they're based in Boston, and then Data Collective and Fuel Capital. What attracted you to those three funds or firms? Um, that's a good question. So I know Data Collective, uh, I, I'd known the folks there for a long time, just through the, you know, working in the data space for a long time. Uh, Fuel was actually just getting started and it was just somebody introduced us and uh, they were just great. They immediately kind of understood what about our business and actually cared about the design of our product. And uh, yeah, so it was, uh, you know, and, and and honestly, in the in the early days, it was people who were, uh, People were excited about the product and really like saw the vision and were going to like, you know, stick with us and, you know, and care, cared about the company and cared about building something. Um, do, you think you, do you think you had an advantage as a Facebook alum? I mean, certainly there's probably a lot of investors out there that love the opportunity to work with someone that was so early on in Facebook. Uh, yeah, I'm sure it helped. Um, I mean, certainly in getting in sort of the door and, you know, getting getting started talking to people i mean at the end of the day to actually close around i have to convince them i have a real a real business a real product but uh but yeah i think it definitely helped in kind of getting started uh, although the yc experience helped enormously with that too i was it was it was uh yeah i mean kind of every round of investors are is your best advocate for talking to your next round right oh of course so talk to us now about the growth since y combinator you guys have raised a bunch of money you've hired a bunch of people uh, you work with some great companies. How are you finding those companies to work with? Do you have a dedicated, you know, a BDR team or a sales team, whatever you might call them? Yeah. So we started pretty early on with a uh, with a real sales team. So so again, kind of we were three engineering founders, and we didn't really know anything about sales and marketing. So uh, so another thing with our early investors is we tried to build a board of people who who had done this before and knew knew how to do it, and so. Uh, that was uh, that was really important, but pretty early on, we had uh, we we hired a head of sales, and you know that's been uh, so. So we do uh, we have a we have a sales and marketing team now. Uh, later than we should have, we built out a customer success and customer support team, um, which is actually the really important part for having lots of big customers. Um, so we have uh, you know significant effort devoted to making sure those people have a have a good experience. Um, no. cause you know, at the beginning, like the, are, are know, most customer, of your clients, customer. are most of your clients in the tech industry? Uh, yeah, most of them are in the tech industry. Um, not all of them. So we have, uh, although, I mean, honestly, basically any company that 
is every company is becoming more a tech company now. So, uh, you know, for example, we, uh, you know, when we work with Comcast that, you know, you might not call them a tech company, but if you go, you know, talk to the, the, it, it looks very much like a tech company. They, uh, you know, they have, they have users they need to keep happy. They're sort of in constant contact with their users now. And they, uh, you know, every, you know, it's one of the things with, uh, people talk a lot about IoT as sort of this coming thing. What I think of it as is the world is just getting instrumented and measured so that the whole, so every company looks like, like a web and mobile company. This is Jonah Lupton, founder of Jewel and host of the Startup Sense podcast. At Jewel, we help entrepreneurs and startup founders build, launch, and grow their companies by providing superior technology, marketing, and consulting services. We help clients of all sizes, budgets, and industries. We put our clients in the best position to raise capital, grow revenues, hire employees, and maximize their profits. For more information or to set up a free consultation with our team, please visit our website at jewel.net. That's J-O-O-L dot net. How long do you think the sales cycle is? I mean, since you guys are going after some larger companies, are they do they make quick decisions when it comes to products like this? Um, you know, it not usually. <laughs> it 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 varies. I mean, it kind of depends how uh you know, most companies can make a very quick decision to sort of do a small pilot or something. But if you're actually going to be an important part of their business process, uh, you know, we certainly, um, you know, it, it'll be into months of uh, sales cycle. Okay. And then and, who are you guys typically, are you typically talking to the other company's CTO? Uh, so often um, some of our uh, most uh, sort of heavy users, the end user of the product are actually uh, product managers. So okay. often there'll be sort of more technical marketing folk, uh, product managers, uh, sometimes CTO and engineering. And then uh, because we're a data product, obviously we end up working with data teams as well. And so, uh, but it's, it's some mix of those. It really, uh, when we go in, our, our sort of value proposition is that you can see what your customers and your users are doing to drive better business. So kind of whoever is responsible for, for growing the business is the, the person we want to talk to. So right now your company, I think you said about 70 people. How many how many people on that team, on your team, are actually responsible for sales? Uh I think we're about half and half engineering versus sales and marketing. Wow. Okay. That's a lot of sales and marketing. Yeah. It's uh and are those are you guys doing anything other than outbound sales, meaning, you know, any inbound marketing or you know, social media content? I mean, how else are you guys finding how else are you getting your company in front of these big clients? Yeah, we uh, we we do both those things. We do we do direct uh, direct sales for actually selling the product, but we do a lot of content on our website and a lot of uh, working on SEO and inbound. Uh, and that's uh, we're actually working towards having a uh, yeah a, something that's more like easy to set up, downloadable from the website kind of a product. Uh, and uh, so that's what a, a lot of our engineering effort is. And then on the marketing side, yeah, definitely trying to get uh, inbound social media. What do you think, what's the smallest company you work with? I mean, you don't have to actually give me that. You can give me the name if you want, but just in terms of like uh, maybe, uh, I guess probably it's hard to know revenues. Uh, oh, maybe. Uh, yeah, well, I think... Uh, yeah, we had a, we had a customer that was uh, that I think had two people at the company. Oh, they were, really? They were both heavy users of the product, and then they they got bought by somebody else. Uh, but uh, so we've run the the gamut from very small to very large. Uh, okay, it's uh, but I mean, it it certainly works better for larger companies that have a ton of data that they're trying to analyze. Uh, well, you know, the thing is, is like anybody who uh, like it doesn't take that much data to actually start not fitting in other tools you, know, you get a million lines in excel and you're done with that and so um it's uh we do have a lot of people who uh you know small companies still you know as long as they're collecting data on what what their users are doing almost everybody can pull value out of it um we actually see in the smaller companies we get a really large uh we have a number of customers where more than half their employees use our tool regularly I mean, you would think all the big apps, I mean, I'm just looking at my phone right now, whether it's Instagram or Snapchat or, um, you know, ESPN, LinkedIn, I mean, all these apps need something like this, right? Yeah, absolutely. Are there yeah. other, 
are there other companies out there doing something similar to you guys? Um, there are, there's a lot of, there are a lot of more vertically specific companies. So there's, I mean, there's a million companies doing kind of web and mobile analytics. Um, and then, um, but there are, if you get to the more general purpose tools, it tends to be more of the traditional kind of data warehouses and BI tools. Okay. And so we go into, uh, so when you have like a wide variety of data or you have, uh, sort of more unusual question. I mean, the problem with the really vertical specific tools, a little like the SaaS things, you know, if you set up Google analytics or something, it's really good at telling you the things that it thinks you want to know, <laughs> but it's not, but, um, you know, what, what we do is when you have a, a really wide variety of questions, which, uh, it turns out pretty much everybody does because everybody's business is different. And so, um, so, so that's kind of how we're, we're different than the other people doing it in kind of the web mobile space. But then you get into other kinds of data, and uh, there's sort of this long history of uh, data warehousing tools, which are which are good at some things, but they tend to not do this kind of time data very well. And they also you sort of require a lot of people to set up and maintain. What's your favorite customer success story? Meaning, you know, they 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 started working with your product, and then they suddenly identified some problem or opportunity inside their you know existing business. Yeah, we had a uh, we had a customer with a mobile app that they had launched, and they were trying to figure out what they really cared about getting people to go from logged out to logged in, and they they had a bunch of things that they thought people doing this on their first day would lead them to log in, and a couple of them they were very surprised to find actually dramatically hurt their uptake in their long term retention. Um, and I think well, like one of them was like using search actually like killed the long-term retention. And they went in and they basically, the product manager was, you know, first thought, oh, this must be wrong. And then they, they dug through and found a couple of kind of very specific things about the search flow that made it, uh, that made it frustrating and would, would drop people off from signing up. And so this made, you know, massive change in their, uh, in sort of what was their top line, you know, success criteria for their mobile app. What's been the biggest challenge for you guys so far? Biggest challenge. Um, it's uh, that's a good question. Um, I mean, scaling everything is hard. Um, things are, uh, you know, early on, each person sort of does what their thing is by force of wealth. And once there's a lot of customers, once there's a lot of users, once there's a lot of uh, you know, a lot of sales teams, a lot of it, I mean, just everything is, uh, you know, just making sure that every, you know, every few months the world's different and stop and think about, do we need to change the way we're working as a company? Now, do you guys have your entire team um, in Redwood City all under one roof? Uh, we're mostly here. We have some, uh, we have some remote uh, sales and support folks. Uh, so we have a, a presence in Seattle and also in New York. Okay. So in terms of recruiting, right? I mean, this is a, a question that I like to ask just because it's a, a question every founder has to deal with, you know, especially where you guys are in the Bay Area. There's a ton of talent, but there's a ton of competition. So mm -hmm. what, what's your what's been your recruiting strategy or, you know, any tips that you could give to other founders for finding the right people and bringing them on board? Um, so in terms of in terms of attracting good people, it really, I mean, people have to care about what your company does. And so it's really important that, I mean, and hopefully if you're a founder, you, you care what your company does, but, you know, doing a good job of communicating that to people, um, you know, just as you meet people, you know, who come in or as you work through recruiters, make sure they actually understand why it is that your company is, is something special. Um, and, uh, you know, the other thing is, um, yeah, in terms of, uh, you know, you got to like, Early on, you got to find people who really love the startup life because it's uh, it's crazier than you know working at like a Google or a Facebook now, where kind of everything's you know set up how it's set up. There's just you know massive ambiguity. Maybe, maybe, so in hiring people, maybe, I like expand upon that a little bit because you know for the audience is like two thirds entrepreneurs and people that are thinking about being an entrepreneur, and then the other third are people that are you know trying to decide if they want to work for startups or work for larger companies. So maybe. Yeah. Tell us more about how does the startup life really compare to, you know, when, when you started at Facebook, it was what, a hundred person company. Mm -hmm. And when you left, yeah. it was probably in the thousands, right? 
Yeah. And so, yeah, so I started at Facebook when it was about 100 people and I left, it was several thousand. Um, actually, the difference between Facebook and 100 people and several thousand was less than the difference between sort of, you know, starting out with three people and 100 people. Uh, the amount of, uh, it's easy to underestimate the, just the, the sheer amount of ambiguity that, that you're faced with. And so um, either as a founder or as an employee early on, it's, uh, you know, and it's not just, it, you know, it's not just like the big uh, glamorous questions It's stuff like early on, you got to have office space and furniture and, you know, you're not changing the world by making sure everybody has chairs, but you better make sure everybody's got a chair or you got nowhere to sit. <laughs> and so, um, you know, it's easy to, uh, it's easy to underestimate the, the, the degree to which there's you know, just like no support, you know, every, everything is on you and that's what's right, right. awesome about it, but it's also kind of what's terrifying about it. Right. You still have to be involved with the legal and the accounting and make sure your insurance policies are up to date. I mean, the list goes on and on and on, right? Yeah. Yeah. And you gotta, yeah, you gotta pay your taxes. You gotta do you know, all these things that, uh, you know, and in all the years I was at Facebook, I was, you know, I was doing engineering and I, uh, so it was, it was interesting to see a huge amount of other stuff to deal with. And then also in, even within the engineering, just having, um, you know, starting, you know, building, building stuff from scratch is, is different than, you know, kind of going in and fixing bugs on stuff that's already there. It's just like, you make a lot of decisions and then you, you know, find out several months later if you if you leave the right one. Or not. <laughs> uh, talk to us about you started the company with your wife. Um, I mean, that's a big decision for any couple. So, what what made you guys go that direction? Yeah, well, I mean, we'd always wanted to do it. We love we love doing projects. We love building stuff together. So we, I mean, so we we knew going in that this is a kind of thing that we we love to do together, and we always always wanted to start a company. Um, it's been. You know, I, I think it's actually an enormous advantage to have a like having a strong relationship with your co-founders and a long history. Like, I can't imagine how I could start a company with somebody didn't you know didn't know very well. And so, you know, we've been through a lot of things, good and bad. We know how to communicate with each other. It's uh, you know having very high bandwidth communication between us is really helpful. Um, and our third co-founder, Leo, I'd known for you know, maybe ten years. Uh, and so that's, uh, you know, having, having that trust there is enormously important because, uh, yeah, I mean, stuff is hard and, you know, crazy stuff is happening all the time and being able to, uh, being able to trust, trust each other is just enormously important. What do you think the next couple of years at your company looks like? How, how fast are you guys going to grow? Um, how many people are you going to bring on the team? More capital to raise, any of that stuff? Yeah, I mean, well, uh, I mean, some of those things are are kind of related. I mean, we probably will continue to grow modestly. We're not we're not interested in sort of like doing the double every year, like with headcount and sort of, uh, you know, we'd like to be, um, but we'll be, uh, you know, we're continuing to grow the headcount, probably raise some more money, and then you know, hopefully, keep pushing hard on growing the sales. Uh, but part of the goal is to over time sort of increase the leverage versus just grow, grow, grow and headcount, you know, I'd rather, uh, you know, increase our marketing footprint, increase our sales efficiency, all those kind of things. How do you, how do you balance or think about growth versus profit? Um, yeah, that's a good question. I, I mean, I feel like when you talk to, to investors, they're, uh, they, they swing back and forth from telling you one of them is all important to telling you the other one's all important. <laughs> right. <laughs> and the, uh, you know, obviously, like the the reason you do a leverage business is for growth. So growth is important, um, but you've got to be. It's nice to be close enough to profitable that you don't have to. You're never in a bind to raise money when you don't want to. And, and but strictly being profitable, like if you can raise money to grow faster, like you probably should. And uh, but but I think the things that are important are that you're sort of saying close enough that you're not um you don't end up in a spot where you're desperate to raise money and then uh secondly knowing that your unit economics are good so growth where you're buying traffic and buying business that you lose money on and doing more and more of that is 
a, a terrible business. But if you know that what you have has strong unit economics, and if you're, you know, spending out in front to, you know, to hire sales and marketing or to do R and D, then you know there. If you you know if, if you know basically if money is available, you probably should use it to grow faster. Who are three clients that you guys don't currently work with that you would like to? You know, perhaps we get lucky and someone listening to the show works for one of those companies. Um, I'd, I'd love to work with some publishing companies. Um, we have a couple, but I think that's, uh, I think they just, I don't know when I've talked to, to folks in those businesses, we just recently opened our New York, uh, sort of New York sales. And so we've been talking to a lot of publishers. Um, so people that I think would be great for us would be, uh, you know, people like NBC or Viacom or, okay. um, uh, people uh you know essentially in the yeah publishers and media and entertainment okay perfect yeah there's a certainly a lot of them in new york i mean is that is that one reason that you guys open up the new york office to be closer to the publishers yeah that's part of it it's um uh, yeah it's nice because there are you know lots of uh you know it's a, it's a, it's a good next uh location for for sales on the east coast because the the publishing business is there and there's also still a uh uh there's there's a pretty st- strong startup um uh, ecosystem there as well so there are quite a few tech companies so that made that like a nice uh just kind of a clear choice for where to where to expand awesome anything we skipped over that you wanted a chance to mention on the show ah. no i don't think so i um yeah you know i, I might mention a little bit more about uh the uh the the YC experience and doing, doing okay. early Definitely. on. Yep, certainly. Uh, what what did the, you want to mention? Yeah, I mean it was uh the thing that was the thing that was really great about it was that it was really optimistic. That early on when you talk to VCs, uh investors in general, they tend to basically you tell them your idea and your idea is usually poorly formed <laughs> compared you know, you you know, years later, you'll go back and you'll tell the story as if you had it all figured out. But at the time, you sort of have this like partly formed idea. And most investors will just tell you all the reasons that it's going to fail, or they'll give you the list of competitors that you haven't even heard of yet. Absolutely. Um, and YC, they say, well, if you talk to somebody who wants this, okay, and do you actually think you can build it? And if the answer is yes to both those things, then, you know, boom, go go build it and get it to that person who wants it. And that's... uh you know, just that mindset was just dramatically better because it can be really demoralizing to go talk to investors again and again and just sort of, you know, hear, you know, for, first of all, hear no, but more importantly, sort of hear, here's no and here's all the reasons that, like, this is hopeless. You're going to get crushed. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and, like, you know, you might get crushed, but, like, you can't, you, you know, if you, if you go in just sort of assuming you're going to get crushed, you definitely will. <laughs> you need to go in sort of knowing, you know, figure out what is the sort of, sort of the kernel of value that I have right now and double down on that, get it out there, get it working, find the next thing. I mean, I think that is dead on. I'm, in my current business, same thing kind of happened. I went out and talked to a bunch of investors and they're like, this is not going to work. If this was going to work, a big company, we've already done it. Um, you're you know, and they gave me, like you said, gave me 20 reasons why I was going to get crushed by the big, you know, big companies that were already in this space. And then I finally found one person that was like, I'll give you some funding. Let's see if you can do it. Um, yeah. and, there's one or two people that are willing to give you a chance, you know, that I guess the glass is half full for them. <laughs> which is yeah, exactly. What you need as a founder. Yeah. And it's not, and I mean, in your first few, like it's not the competition that's going to crush you. It's going to be either that you were wrong about what people wanted or that you were unable to build it. And right. that's, you know, or you're just, so it's uh, yeah, it was funny. I was one of the people from uh, Airbnb was saying that when they started, there was a, uh, you know, there's already the couch surfing thing website, but they didn't know about it. And they said, yeah, if we'd known about that, we might not have done this. That's a good point. Sometimes being being naive or blind or just <laughs> unaware yeah. is a good thing. Yeah. And like, yeah. So, uh, you know, you can't get too focused on that. Like as long, I mean, when we went out, there's like, you know, there's a million analytics companies and everybody, you know, it's just like, that's, you know, that's been done. Except that if I go talk to people about their analytics, most people are not happy with what they have today. So you know, that game isn't done, even though there's a thousand other companies working on it. So very true, very that. true. Big, big space. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I could rattle off five or six different analytics companies that come to, to come to mind, but 
I don't think any of them are doing what you guys are, are you know, are, are taking it to the level that you guys are taking it to. So, you know, most, most of them are like doing kind of Google analytics stuff, you know, click rates and where's your inbound traffic coming from and stuff like that. I mean, you guys are way more than that. Yeah. We're trying very hard to be a general purpose tool. Well, Bobby, thank you so much, man. I really appreciate you coming on the show today. I know you're a busy guy with a lot of employees to keep an eye on. So I'll let you uh, get running. Um, what's the best way that we connect with you online and then learn more about the company? Uh, yeah, come to uh, interana.com or follow us on Twitter as Interana Corp. Or, uh, yeah, on, on Facebook. But, yeah, if you come to our site, you can see we've got a live demo up. You can play with it and see if it's something you want. Cool. And are you active on any social media or do you have a blog or anything like that? Uh, I, I post on Interana's blog occasionally, and uh, I do have a Twitter handle. I think I'm Interana Bobby on Twitter. Okay. I'll try to find you, and I'll stick that in the show notes. Well, thank you so much, man. Uh, like I said, you guys are off to a great start here. Hope it continues for you, and uh, look forward to staying in touch. Yeah, thanks a lot. It was great talking to you. you got it, man. Thanks, Bobby. Talk to you soon. Bye.